Today on The Possibility Mom Live, we are talking about the pandemic pregnancy boom. I'm going to be discussing if every job should accommodate for pregnancy and child raising or if only certain jobs do and then therefore we've got to change jobs. And we're going to talk about with my very special guest and associate if it's really possible to sell everything and travel abroad with kids. Welcome to the Possibility Mom Live. <laughs> Welcome to the Possibility Mom Live, the live show where I give you a weekly dose of hope, introduce some practical strategies, and have conversations about modern motherhood. As always, I want to encourage you to join me in the chat, ask your questions, and engage in this content. First up, the pandemic pregnancy boom. Now, I don't know if you know this about me, but I studied ballet for like a long, long time from when I was really, really small, like age of four, I think I started, all the way until I was late in high school. And I just love ballerinas. I think they are just the most graceful, you know, I love, love, love the ballet world. And so it was really, really, really interesting for me to see when the New York Times did a story on ballerinas and how the impact of the pandemic was actually causing them to have babies. And so this article is so interesting to me. It just starts so provocative. I wish I got pregnant in March inside the dance baby boom. Many dancers have taken advantage of a byproduct of the pandemic, time away from performing to try out a new role, motherhood. And it's so fascinating. Um, I want to highlight a couple of the stories here. Megan Fairchild's former dance teachers gave her some advice. Now would be a really great time to get pregnant. Fairchild, a principal at New York City Ballet, was a guest. I was like, that's a ridiculous idea and the last thing on my mind right now. This is going to last a couple of months and I don't want to not be there when we get back. But then, of course, as we know, Days turned into weeks and she began to experience another emotion. It was clear that she was going to be um, away from the stage for a long time. And eventually she did the math and she started to, you know, discern that, you know what, it was time. And here she is pregnant with twins and her other daughter. And basically she very recently gave birth to twins and she didn't think that she was ready. But upon meditation, she was like, do it now. And she came up with this statement, I wish I had gotten pregnant in March. And the article goes on to express how so many other dancers and performers have also gotten pregnant during this time. Brittany Polak, who is uh, married to Jonathan Stafford, City Ballet's artistic director. And I wanna just go down to the bottom of this article because there's a really interesting quote from a Moulin Rouge, the musical performer who, made a very bold statement around babies and performance and if the industry should change. So let me just read this right here. It's very hard to have a child and then manage coming back, especially for performers and dancers. It's a struggle and we're not really set up for success. She says that, um, that Moulin Rouge was a show that seemed to last, it was gonna last for a while. And while she was in great shape, her body was also depleted from the Broadway schedule. It is really a challenge to make space and room for any sort of balance outside of your career when you're a dancer or performer. You get a job and you're like, great, I'm gonna do that job. But you don't know when the next gig is gonna come. And that is a challenge. And it, she says it right here, it's usually at the detriment of your significant other or you're missing weddings, funerals, and babies. And what she goes on to say is that there's a culture of fear. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't call out, I'll lose my job. And that dancers go along with that culture to hold on to roles. That to me has got to go. I know it's rampant in the ballet world. It's rampant everywhere. And she asks here, a dancer's schedule, fluctuating rehearsals during the day, performances at night can make family time difficult. 
How sustainable is it to have a baby while balancing eight shows a week? What if a Broadway show had two casts or fewer shows? And that, my friends, if we can come back to me, is the question I think we need to ask. Is that what if she says there at the end? What if a Broadway show could have two casts? so that it wasn't so demanding on one person. And the question that that leads me to is, should every job accommodate for pregnancy and the raising of kids, or do we need to change jobs? Now, I don't know if I have the exact answer. (laughs) I definitely have an opinion. I don't know if I have the exact answer because I think it really depends. I think it's hard to have this conversation without understanding how different every industry is, um, understanding what support a woman has at home. But I think what she's asking in that question, in that New York Times article, and I've linked it below in the description of this show, is the right question to ask. Well, how? And so then what I would say, if I was coaching a mom who said, I really want to be a Broadway reporter, performer, but I have no idea how I would do that with a family. So then I would tell her, well, what can you control in your work? I think it really comes down to these two questions. What can you control in your work? And what can you control at home? So let's tackle work. Maybe it's possible that there's two casts and you have somebody who's cast A, cast B, you've got half the week on, half the week off. So you're able to see your children and and your spouse a lot during that half of the week off. But what if that's not possible? What if it's just not the way that a Broadway show is um, run? The second question I would say is what can you control at home? And um, for example, I can't control right now, there's a baby crying (laughs) in the room beside me (laughs) that I'm sure my husband is going to magically break into my bedroom and (laughs) retreat. So what can you control at home? And what that looks like to me is what support have you got for childcare? What support have you got for home maintenance? What support have you got for meal prep? What support have you got for all the things? So I can tell you from personal experience with me and Josh, I have worked in television, which I would say is very similar to what the ballet dancers are talking about, whereas sometimes my hours were 16 hours plus days. Sometimes they were um, an enormous amount of moving parts, stress, where I was very much attached to my phone and very much attached to my work for the season. Now, if you know my story, you know ultimately I left that world because I personally found it unsustainable. But what I will say is the conversations we had, Josh and I, was can we do this for a season? I think the problem, if I'm being very honest, is that I let the seasons go on forever. But could we do this for a season? I know moms who, you know, have uh, traveled for work, for example, and then um, they they have just simply made that decision with their family that this is the right sacrifice to make for this finite period of time. And I think that's the thing. It's If it's not finite, that's where it can become dangerous and where we have to ask some really difficult questions. And so to answer this question, should a mom, you know, should every job accommodate pregnancy and the raising of kids? That's my humble opinion, I think they should. Um, But can they? I wonder if some of them can, I wonder if they cannot. And if they cannot, if it just is not possible, then I would say perhaps it is up to a mom and a family to discern perhaps there's another way. But see, the other way, doesn't always necessarily to me mean you're changing jobs. Maybe it means you're doing the job in a very different way. Maybe it means that you're coming up with something very innovative and very creative. Maybe it means you're turning the industry on its head and you're being the person who's being patient and leading the way for others. And that's why I'm so excited to introduce you to my featured possibility mom of the week, Megan Bring, oh gosh, I'm so sorry, Megan Giffard. Giffard, I think is how you pronounce her last name. And she has an incredible platform called Armed to the Heart. And what Megan is doing is really challenging the role of women in the 
army. So she is armed to the heart on Instagram and she is arming military moms and beyond to love, serve and contribute. She is educating, inspiring and advocating. She's a strategist in the woman's school and one glance at her Instagram reveals just what an incredible mama she is. Let's take a look at this one. She, oh, ho, ho, I didn't know this. This is a surprise. She is now pregnant with her second child. This is her pregnancy announcement. That's amazing. And um, in conversations I have had with this gorgeous woman, she is working very hard to advocate for women in the army. We've had conversations about what it looks like to be pregnant while being on duty, what it looks like to have modified um, duties when on duty, and just the what the impact of having a child um, and being pregnant does, obviously, when you are serving. She is so passionate about um, changing things for the better. She recently did, uh, let's see if I can find it really quickly, but she recently gathered together the thoughts. Um, here we go. So, sir, after gathering input from, um, after gathering input from the Army Mom Life Facebook group, which has over 3,000 service members, we're finalizing a proposal of top five recommended policy changes on pregnancy and postpartum to support the holistic health readiness and retention of service members' families. You know, and I think this brings up a really good point. Thank you, Megan, for all of your hard work and what you are doing um, for women, especially in the military. And I think that 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 last point on retention is the thing that I like to think about. Yes, can we change jobs? Absolutely, we all have the freedom to maybe go into either a different profession altogether or as I've been sharing, do something in a totally radically unique way. But I'm not naive that you can't always like change something completely. You can't, there, there are certain aspects of certain professions that you can't creatively do from home, for example. For example, a surgeon, you kind of can't be creatively a surgeon at home. You know what I mean? Like. Um, there, there are, there are some professions where you can really think about at home work, but certain ones you just can't. Um, but retention, if we want to retain amazing female talent in the various industries that exist, there has got to be a different approach to how we treat them both when they are pregnant and when they have a child. If we want to retain amazing women in the industries that exist, there has got to be some creative, new, innovative ways to look at how we treat them when they're pregnant and when they have a child. I think one of the gifts of the pandemic has been the approach to working from home and potentially also the approach to meetings. I'm really curious if now as people are getting vaccinated, if people will start to realize that there are much more efficient ways to do things. I know certain companies, I've met several people who have moved to where I live in Southwest Florida, whose companies have completely eradicated working in offices. They basically, when they shut down for the first time in March of 2020, they just said, we're never coming back. And, you know, and I'm really curious now as, you know, the vaccine is rolling out and whatnot, I'm really curious if there will be more of that or at least an awareness around can we be more efficient and how can we be? more efficient? Because this is a legit question. Should a mom work? And an extension of this question is how does a mom work? And that is something that I talk about for an entire chapter in my book, The Possibility Mom. As you can see, this is the most worn copy. It is so worn. I, it's like ridiculous worn. But in chapter um, eight, I believe, I 
essentially go for a full chapter talking about should a mom work? And so if you have a mom in your life who is either discerning, going back to work, would like to leave their job, would like to start a business, or is just asking these existential questions, I'd love for you to consider picking up a copy for her for Mother's Day, or maybe this could be a great gift to yourself this upcoming Mother's Day. I put a link in the description below where you can get it super quick via Amazon. I would love it if this book would give some joy to a mom in your life. Speaking of joy, and speaking of fun, and speaking of adventure, can you really sell everything and travel with kids? If you've been following my story, and many of you have, because I can see by my analytics that all y'all are searching for how to move to Florida from Ontario, <laughs> there is an enormous amount of people FYI, who want to leave Canada and move to Florida. And so if you've been following my story, you know that fairly recently we moved our family of 10, uh, 10 uh, from Ontario, Canada to Southwest Florida. And when I was doing this, I leaned heavily on the advice of my next guest on all the things like how to pack, how to manage my mind, how to travel with this many children, how to sort of change my mindset because we didn't bring very much. We really left and sold the majority of our items and just came with a very small 10 by 12 trailer on the back of our passenger van. And so I remember asking my next guest, oh my gosh, like, first of all, like, how do you even make those decisions? Um, and, and like, can I really do this? <laughs> can I really leave my life that I know as it was at that time and embark on this brand new opportunity. And so I'm so excited to welcome to the Possibility Mom Live, my dear friend and client, Anna Socie. Anna, welcome. Hi, Lisa. Can oh, you hear me? I sure can. And you look so beautiful. How are Thank you? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm adjusting my you get kid artwork up above me. I love it. <laughs> I love it. it. I'm great. I'm great. How are you? I am exceptional. So Anna, for anyone who might not know you and your story, can you share with us a little bit of who you are and how you got here? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're talking selling everything and going to travel, right? So it was almost two years ago that um, we I had a 18 month old at the time. And my oldest was almost four and we sold everything from our San Diego home, pretty much everything. And we set out to travel and like be fully nomadic. And we actually got it down to carry on only. We had carry on only on the, in the airplane. I, I do remember I, it was it was great to hear your story again and those connections between the two of us when you were moving. And I remember it, actually one of the first most challenging things was how do I get rid of all this stuff? <laughs> right. Which is funny. It's not like how do I actually go, but how do I get rid of this? And so and I think that goes over into not just stuff, but like how do I get rid of like a whole mindset shift? Ugh. Right. I mean, I, I, I remember so distinctly one conversation I had with you via, I remember we were voice memoing, or at least you were voice memoing. I think I was typing, you were voice memoing. And I was like, what do you do with the stuff that you know you can't throw out? Like, for example, I have eight children. So I had like the kindergarten memories of at that point, seven or whatever, how many kids I had had in school. Like, what do you do with your stuff from your wedding? What do you do with your stuff from you know, like just the stuff that you don't want to throw out and like maybe you don't want to leave it in storage because maybe you want to look at it. I don't know. And I just remember so distinctly, you shot me a picture of this Tupperware bin. <laughs> it was just this huge Rubbermaid or whatever. And you were like, yep, in this is what I have. Blank, 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 blank. And I was like, oh my word. Like this woman is so simple. <laughs> she has so much detachment. I think when I started my move, Anna, I kid you not, I think I had like one massive memory Rubbermaid per child. And I was like, okay, we can, we can take some pictures. 
we can scan some, I can save some, but how can we reduce this all? So take us back to that time when you and your husband had decided, okay, we're going to go on this adventure. You know, you had done all the research, obviously, on the different things, but how did you begin this experience of jumping in two feet into the unknown? Yeah, we knew that we wanted to do this someday. And it had, it had kind of become, well, when the kids are older, because then everything becomes simpler. I mean, remember how old my kids were? We, there's car seats, there's strollers, you know, they can't, I mean, an 18 month old, they're not gonna walk through these massive airports on their own. So there's all, the, all these considerations. And so it was when they get older, but we were living in San Diego, like both working our butts off just to keep up with, um, and I, I love my work, so I, I want to work. And, and we, had our, we had the kids in a great childcare situation, but it was $1,200 a month, you know? And so it was the, it was the point where it became almost heavier to stay. Mm. And we knew this was a dream that we wanted to pursue. And it, it was like almost like a turning point or a pivot point where it was like, you know what, we can, we can overcome all these little things and we can figure those out because this is what we want to do. So, you know what, it, it's like what so many things where you just have to make the decision mm. and then start, yeah, we're going to do it. And here's the date. We had actually attended a conference in Mexico um, it was the October before we left in June and it was a conference of families I called family adventure summit. They're not doing it anymore, but it, it was fantastic. We got to meet a whole bunch of families who'd been doing this for years. And we made a family of eight who had been traveling the world fully nomadic. Um, since like, I don't know, I think it had been 12 years and we were just so inspired by that. And that really helped us to say, oh yeah, okay, we can figure out all of these details. But we need to do this now so we don't lose all of that time and keep putting off our dreams. Ah, beautiful. So what it also sounds like is you touched the dream. You went to this conference. You saw yeah. other families who were already doing it. You met this one family and realized, oh, my word, if they can do it with, you know, a family of eight, we can do it with our family of four. So it sounds like you touched yeah. the dream a little bit. Um, what happens next? You, you, you mentioned that you, you make a decision and then you take action. How do you know you're taking the right action? Ooh, that's a good question. You don't, <laughs> you don't. I mean, um, it, it's so interesting. When you asked me about the hit taking risks, like this is, this is a big risk, right? The biggest thing that we learned is that, especially with a family, each person has their own um, perspective about what the next thing is, uh, their own risk tolerance for different things, their own way that they need to be cared for in a process of constant transition, mm -hmm. right? And so as we take steps toward that dream, I think the, the biggest thing that we had to learn is that it's not really so much the, the step and if it's the right step, but how are we caring for each person in the family in the process? Hmm. And how are we respecting their needs in, you know, in that next step? Because we don't know. I mean, there's no way to know, is this the next right step? Well, we can, and what we've learned too is that I mean, I, I have, we're both adventurous, my husband and I, but I have a much higher risk tolerance okay. and he has a much, he carries a, a greater weight of especially safety responsibility for the family. And that's just natural and that's great. And we complement each other really well that way. But I've seen us grow so much in that I look back and, and notice where he needs to think through and plan like several contingencies for something, right? And that used to really annoy me. It's like, well, he's looking for all the negative. You know, he's, um, he's trying to find a problem or he's not as adventurous as I am. And so I had all these stories about his behavior and he had these stories about mine because I seemed dismissive at thinking through the contingencies and thinking through the safety. You know, but what we've learned is, what we've learned is that we're a great, 
a, a great pair together and that we can change things in our own minds for me to say, ah, okay, that's what, that's what he needs. It just in order to process this and in order to feel his responsibility of caring for the family. Mm. But because here, here's an interesting thing, and I hope not going to into too much detail, it's just fun to reflect on these things. Um, because I'm such a detailed person, what I realized I was doing is for all his contingencies that he was talking about, I was like going into detail mode on all of them. And that okay. uses up so much energy, right? Because as a mom, I'm constantly thinking, okay, what are we going to wear? Where are we going to eat? Where are we going to sleep? You know, who's going to, who's going to play with what while we're in this 20 hour, 12 hour airplane trip in all of these things. But that's not what I needed to do in order to just respect and care for him in the process he needed to go through. Yeah. Right. And it's the same with the kids. They, they each have their individual personalities and this, and the ways that they need to be cared for and the way that they need to process it in the moment. I love it. So let's talk about stress in the pursuit of caring for everyone in their own particular <laughs> way. Because you have traveled to how many countries? I mean, pre-COVID, obviously. Like, how many countries did you visit? Ooh, yeah, that's a good question. Mexico, Canada, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. Five. Yeah, five, five pre-COVID. Okay. So, and you live for various lengths of time and all of those places. Yeah, usually a month or two. Yeah, amazing. So, um, I am sure there have been some stressful situations. You know, there's language to navigate. There's health stuff to navigate. I feel like you could teach us a whole online course about how <laughs> to navigate healthcare in multiple countries. You navigated finding an au pair to travel with you. Like you, you've navigated a lot of things. So tell us how you manage stress in all of these different moments? Whew, yeah, that's a good question. You know, as, as you said that, the thing that came to mind was when we, we landed in a Thailand, in Chiang Mai, Thailand from Bali and found our Airbnb. And within two hours, my son had been running at full speed across the room and banged into the corner of a nightstand and like completely split open his forehead, right? So we're in Thailand, no, I, you know, not, none of the language. I don't even think we had learned hello yet. Um, none of the money, you know, no idea even like where a hospital was, but we knew we had to, he was gonna have, need to have stitches and everything. So it was like, oh man, it was like one of those, I mean, we had those situations where like, no, 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 that does not happen. That did not just happen, right? Um, but you really have to just go into, okay, yep. What's the next step? So the next step is put something on it and, um, what, what do we need? You know, we need to have passports and money and we go out the door and we find a person who we can ask to help us with the next step. And so I think, you know, what, what comes to mind in that, in just feeling that situation again is you really just have to take everything else off the table and care for the people and ask what is the next step what's the next yeah what's the next i, don't, I hate to even use the word right you know <laughs> because that then then you start judging yourselves and all this stuff but one of the things that i like to use with the women that i coach is what's the obvious next step Ooh. And I love that language. Um, it comes from Richard Ralston, who is fantastic at, at um, uh, this process he's developed for um, accountability groups and mastermind groups. And we use it in mine, in my Rise Mastermind. What is the obvious next step? And I really, really like that. Yeah, that's a great one. It, it, it's interesting because it's such a subtle distinction. What's the next right step? And what's the obvious next step? Because you're exactly right. When you put that qualifier right, you can have all of a sudden another dramatic dance party. Like, oh, oh my gosh, but I don't know what yeah. is the next step. It could be this, it could be this, it could be this. So what is the obvious next step? Put something on it, put some pressure on it. Do we have shoes on? Do we have passports? Do we have money? Let's go yeah. find someone. 
speaks English. So do you mind sharing with us? Like what, what did you do? Did you literally find somebody on the street? Like what happened? Well, we were in an apartment complex that had like a security gate. So we found somebody there and said, I mean, you, when you don't know the language, your language is to become very simple. It's like hospital taxi, right? <laughs> when, when you're hospital and we need a taxi. Um, but there was even a miscommunication there. So we're like, ah, so we had seen, we had actually read about these red trucks in, in particularly in Chiang Mai. They're, they're, they're like taxis there, but they're these red trucks with an open back and just bench seats on, on the, in the back of the truck, right? It's got the cab and then it's got the back and it's covered, but it has like bench seats. And so literally we like walked out to the main road, flagged down one of these red trucks, got in, and it's like hospital, hospital, you know, we, oh, we didn't even have a local SIM card yet. So we didn't have data on our phones. So it was a completely trusting, completely trusting other people. And so we got to the hospital and um, checked in and my poor, my son is very um, just sensitive to other people touching him and being in his space. So it, I mean, that the whole thing was just very, very challenging. Um, as parents to be first be in a vulnerable situation, put your kid in a vulnerable situation. Um, thank God. I mean, I'm so grateful for the, this one doctor who spoke excellent English and just very attentive to, to caring for us um, in this time. And so and just that, that, that immense gratitude that you can feel for someone who really cares for you in that vulnerable situation. But literally, it was just neck. Okay, okay. There's a truck. We know that truck takes people where they want to go, so we're gonna get in it, and then ask to go to the hospital. And sorry, let me clarify: is the truck that's red was that a general taxi or a specific like medical taxi? No, no, they're just like general taxis. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Wow. Wowza! 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 Okay. So, and then did the doctor speak English? The one did. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. wow. Very, very grateful for him. Yeah. So I've got one more question before I open it up to people's questions who are watching. If you've got a question for Anna, just type it into the chat. I've been doing a lot of reflecting on this because I moved from a very large city where I had access to many things that made me feel very comfortable. So like shopping, different kinds of food, very um, easy to go and do things for leisure, like see a movie, all those kinds of things to a place that is very remote. I live in a town that has a grocery store and has obviously all your essentials, but it has one grocery store. And it closes at, I think, 9 p.m., maybe 10 p.m., which is very different than the life I was used to in Toronto where literally 24 hours was like normal. Sure. Like it was yeah. normal for the grocery store to be open 24 hours. And so I've been doing so much reflecting in this past, you know, 18 months where I've lived in my new place and especially with the pandemic, what does it mean to feel like a place is home? Mm. And I am still discerning what that looks like. But as someone who has traveled, you said five different countries, if I'm not mistaken, you've lived in multiple probably places, even within those spaces. What does home mean to you, Anna? Hmm. Yeah, I'm with you on the, um, I guess you were just making the distinction, not necessarily a judgment, but I love cities. I love having you know lots of things to do. Um, that's what we're attracted to. Um, and, you know, and, and just kind of, you know, move to and where we choose to be mostly. But I think home, though, is a little bit different. And we have had instances where we're not in that space. We're not in our ideal environment or even for the kids or even, you know, if something is one night, like we're, we're in transition. And it's because when, you, when we're, you're full-time nomadic, nothing is permanent. So I, I, I remember actually my son seeing at one point, because we left before he was four, so it was almost he didn't really – process anything different. And he asked about a family that we knew from home. And he said, when are they moving to their next house? You know, <laughs> when are they going to their, to their next house? Because that was normal for him. And so I, I mean, to answer your question, I think home is 
where we gather and sleep at the end of the day. I mean, it's yeah. not really poetic, you know, it's just, it's very simple. It's where we, we gather back together and it's where we rest. Huh. That's so interesting. What does rest look like to you? Mm. Uh, for me, it's different to, for different people in the family. For me, it is settling in. Like I do need to take some time whenever we get somewhere, even if it's for one night, I need to settle in. Um, and because we've moved so much, that process can be very simple. I think my mom was laughing at me one time. I think it was when we got to Malaysia. Um, I, I say I sent her a photo or I always she wanted to see a video of where we are. We're in each spot. So I'd like just take a video like here's the kitchen, you know, here's the bedrooms. She's like, didn't you land like an hour ago? I'm like, yeah, I'm done settling in because we have two backpacks and a carry on suitcase. But it doesn't take very long. <laughs> So, I, so yeah, I do need to take that time. What does that mean to settle in? Like, is that unpacking a backpack fully? Is it putting that backpack then like away in a closet? Like, what does that look like for you? Um, yeah, I mean, if we're going to be in a place for more than one night, if it's not just like a hotel, then, you know, the hotel, then I'm just opening up and we're pulling out clothes and I, I put the bathroom bag in the bathroom and that's probably pretty much it. But if we're staying in a place for a month, yes, it's taking everything out. Um, letting the kids like pick a drawer where their stuff is going to belong, um, unpacking the stuff in the bathroom so that it, it has people's toothbrush has a place, you know, and I think it's really important um, as a family to, to function um, through that it, or to make, I guess it's to make that transition time as short as possible, because when you're going to be there for just a month, that you know, if you take a week to figure everything out and to create new routines, you know, you're gonna be gone in three weeks and that's exhausting. So, you know, we just really had to simplify and, um, you know, and, and quicken that process of what are the, gonna be the routines? Where do people, where does people's stuff belong? You know, um, what's that gonna look like when you get up and where's your things and, you know, where's your toothbrush and those? So it, it just helps everybody to, to know their, their place um, yeah. both in that space and in the family. That is so fascinating. Okay. What have you seen that you have consistently brought from home to home? That's like non-negotiable, like that hundred percent makes it in the bag, doesn't get donated, doesn't get sold. Like what's, what's one thing for you, Anna, that's like non-negotiable. It's in my backpack. Oh, boy, there's not much Lisa. I mean, I, with so, it, it's more, it's really like the necessities. I mean, do you have my glasses? <laughs> do I have my glasses? I have to be able to see. And my laptop, because I have to be able to work. Um, gosh, but really. Wait that's a minute. Probably Wait. it. <laughs> Come on, like, what about like, do you have like a favorite lip gloss? Do you have a favorite like sweater? I chapstick. Um, I mean, I have, I have the clothes, but the clothes are just, a, there's a function Yeah. and wherever you go. I mean, if I don't, I mean, Lisa, literally like when, when the pandemic hit and things shut down, right. We had about 12 hours notice that the border was going to be shut down between Malaysia and Singapore. And we would have to fly out of Singapore. We decided, I mean, we booked a flight on Saturday, the 14th for the next day for the 15th. And, um, I got out with the kids. Like I flew, I flew across the world with the kids and left my husband to like kind of clean up in the apartment and wind things up. Um, and he barely made it out. And so I think it's just these, when you, when you go through those things, it's like, what do I actually need? I need to make sure my kids are with me. You know, we need to make sure we're safe. I'm kind of getting emotional about this, but really the other things, like wherever you go, you can, you can get stuff. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. Oh, it's so beautiful. I think it's a helpful reminder that we can sometimes place too much emphasis on the circumstance to make us happy. Mm. Like, oh, I'll be so happy once I have a pool. Oh, I'll be so happy once, you know, my closet is organized. Oh, I'll be so happy once, you know, X, Y, Z. And certainly these things can help our lives. They can bring us joy, all the things, but really at the heart of it all, it's often, well, no, it's everyone. It's our thoughts around the circumstance mm -hmm. that determine 
are. It's so, so true. And that was such a huge theme for me. Um, I feel like right after college and this expectation that was placed on, okay, you go to college, you get a job, you find a man, you have kids, you know, there was just this process that you were supposed to follow. And then we struggled seven years with infertility and we didn't have that step. And so, you know, I, I had been just seeped in that thinking of I'll be happy when, okay, I'll be happy when, you know, the next step and find the guy, you know, get married. I'll be happy when you have kids, but I had to let go of that. I mean, you had to, in order to find a way to live, um, even when, when something big was missing. Wow. That's so, and so I'm so, so grateful. I mean, I can be, I can look back I can just be really grateful for that because you know, it probably opened up the possibility of, of what we're doing now. I love it. Okay. We've got a question from Natalie B. Natalie, what Natalie asks, what has been the blessing of traveling to new countries with kids and is it best to wait until they're older? Oh, good question. The, the thing that comes to mind, Natalie, of that has been the biggest blessing is to see my kids just accept people, you know, anybody, no matter whether they speak the same language or not, they just see people. And to me, I mean, I value that so much and um, to not have the, just the preconceived notions of you're from here or from there, you know, we speak this language or don't, or, you know, the color of your skin or whatever religion. Um, we're just curious about connecting with people wherever they are, whatever they're doing, um, you know, whatever they say or whether or not we can communicate with them. And so that yeah, I've, I've really loved to see that in my kids where it's just like, it, it, and I'll see them be surprised to be, oh, that was English. You know, I just heard somebody speak English. Um, is it best to wait? I don't, I mean, it. I think it totally depends on the family, but I might actually say it's best not to wait. Oh, wow. Um, yes. Is it harder? Yes. It's harder to travel with little kids. I mean, when we set off, yeah, we had a little bit of luggage because their clothes don't take up very much space, but we had a stroller. I had three different carriers because I was really risk averse on like going through airports and carrying kids. That to me, that is exhausting, like carrying a kid. So we had a stroller and I had, I guess, two different carriers. No, because we had the backpack carrier too. So it was three um, plus a car seat because she was only 18 months when we took off. So yes, it's harder, you know, and there's more adjustment and there's more things that you have to do for them. But it also is, those years are so formative and that part is easier. Like it, that's, yeah, it, it just is so much easier for them to transition into that lifestyle, I think, when they're younger. So fun. Anna, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. I know you've got something really fun coming up. Share with us this fun new thing you've got happening, I believe, next week. Yeah. Oh, well, actually, tomorrow. It starts oh! tonight. Uh, <laughs> the, the Unexplained Infertility Summit starts tonight with our, our happy hour for um, our premium pass holders. But the main event is tomorrow, the Unexplained infertility summit this is such a passion of mine as i mentioned earlier we struggled seven years with infertility and so many women are told um well we don't know what's wrong you know you'll have to do ivf or you'll have to do something else and i'm um, so passionate about sharing the help that i received in, in that there are doctors healthcare professionals um, and experts who understand how to look for and find those underlying problems of infertility and restore those to function and health so that couples can conceive naturally. I love it. I love it. Anna, you are such a gift. Thank you so much for being my guest today on the Possibility Mom Live. And I just love learning from you. Thank you, Anna. Lisa, I'm honored. Thank you so much. Yay! Oh, Anna, she's just so good. And you can learn more about Anna Saussier and the work that she does with women and how she supports 
change makers in the women's health space and wellness by visiting the link below. You know, it's interesting what she said about home and settling in. So I think I think for her it feels like home to settle in. And I th that's just a very interesting thing. Like what does it mean to feel settled? Where I have I think come sort of I've landed now 18 months from moving to a very new place. Uh, 18 months and the pandemic of the things that used to bring me comfort, let's say. So shopping, like super close access to shopping, um, super close access to food, uh, super close access to all these things. Um, what I think is more important is the people you are around. Now, of course, that's so, I feel like, simple to say, like meaning I feel like lots of people would agree that people are more important than things. I think we can all obviously agree on that. But I really have discovered more and more in times of trial, in times of struggle, in times when, for example, like today, my children had an early dismissal from school and it was right exactly at the time of this broadcast. It's the ability to lean on the people around you when you need a hand, when you are moving into a new house, when you are going through stress, when you are dealing with grief and loss. Like that to me is just the most important part of a space feeling like home that creation of community that happens over meals, that creation of community that happens um, in real life, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, so that's what I've been reflecting on is uh, <clears throat> the access I've had to people who um, I care about deeply. Um, and I, I mean, it's so fun when it can happen in real life, but it can also happen virtually, right? Those people whom you can be yourself with and who truly love you and support you and will care for you. That to me is when I think of home, that those are some of the things that I think about. And I think of, um, I think of gin and tonics. Is that weird? <laughs> I think of making a really good gin and tonic at home. My husband is exceptional at making those. Next week on the Possibility Mom Live, I have got my dear friend, Mona Corwin, who goes by the moniker of the Mom Mentor. And we're going to be talking about what it looks like to seek out membership and mentorship, excuse me, mentorship and motherhood, what that means, and how we can also be that for others. So I hope you'll join me next week on the Possibility Mom Live. A reminder that you can still pick up a copy of my book, The Possibility Mom How to Be a Great Mom and pursue your dreams at the same time on Amazon and get, get it real quick um, uh, wherever you live to give to a gift either to yourself or to a mom in your life who needs some hope and some inspiration and practical advice along the journey. I am so grateful for all of you. A very, very happy Friday. Thank you, Janice, so much for that comment that this was an inspiring interview. And you know what, Anne Associate, I agree with you. <laughs> Gin and tonic is where the home is, is not weird at all. May y'all enter this weekend with a gin and tonic in hand or your drink of choice, and I will see you next week.